Look. Governor's claiming this is not an Air Force base. You can see the radar tower and all that in the background. Now if we go down a little, you can see, warning, U.S. Air Force Station. See, this says, warning, U.S. Air Force Station. It is unlawful to enter this area without the permission of the commander of the Montauk Air Force Station. While on this installation, all personnel and property are under the control, are subject to search, etc. Section 21, Internal Security Act, 1959.50 U.S.C. 79. <laughs> the Montauk Project, which was an experiment carried on at Montauk Point, New York, mm -hmm. on the southeastern tip of Long Island, that's off of metropolitan New York, was essentially two projects. It was a mind control project where they did research on how to, uh, you know, influence the mind of man using electromagnetics. It also developed, evolved into a time travel project. They found out that they could actually bend time with the same equipment that they used to bend mines. This all started back in World War II. There was two major projects going on in World War II. One was the Rainbow Project and the other was the Phoenix Project. Essentially the Rainbow Project, well let's first go into the background. During World War II, we were losing the war. We were outnumbered. We had Germany against us, most of Europe at that point. We had Italy against us, we had Japan against us, and it was felt it was a losing cause. So the government was essentially looking for that secret weapon that would win the war. So in 43, that area, 43, late 42, 43, 44, they launched a lot of these very avant-garde, super science type projects out of almost desperation. One of them was the uh, Rainbow Project, which we know is a Philadelphia experiment. This was where they attempted to make a uh, military navy boat invisible, mm -hmm. radar invisible, what they interested in. The other project of interest was the Phoenix Project, which was essentially mind control research. This involved chemical mind control, psychological, the use of PA systems, propaganda. You know, it all started in World War II. They essentially worked on these two projects. The Philadelphia Experiment, or the Rainbow Project, was essentially a failure. What were the dates on the Rainbow Project? The Rainbow Project, actually, the very basic physics research started in the mid-30s. Hmm. But actually, the government got interested after some successful tests were shown by the Advanced Sciences Institute at Princeton. Institute for Advanced Study. Yeah, the Institute mm -hmm. for Advanced Study at Princeton. They showed that on small scale, the invisibility could be achieved. Mm -hmm. This was work based upon the work of Nikola Tesla, Dr. John Eric von Neumann, and others that were in the Institute for Advanced Studies at Princeton. At that point, the Navy realized this thing had a huge tactical application. Mm -hmm. So they backed it and they funded it. And research was done up until August of 1943, which we're not sure is the second to the last test or the last test. Mm -hmm. But August 12, 1943, the project was installed in a ship the Eldridge. It was a destroyer escort class. Mm -hmm. you know, not a real small boat, but not a real big battleship. Mm -hmm. The boat was built a special for the Rainbow Project, mm -hmm. where they were able to take one of the gun turrets on the front of the boat was fake. They could take it off and they had a big opening to drop electronic equipment in. Mm -hmm. Large generators, the whole nine yards of it. Mm -hmm. And by 1943, they had already outfitted the Eldridge with all this equipment. Mm -hmm. And the boat was towed out 
into the harbor, the back end of Philadelphia Harbor, and the order was given to turn the project on, turn on the equipment. Duncan here and his half-brother Al were on the boat, and when they turned everything on, it worked. The boat did become radar invisible. The boat actually became physically, visibly invisible. Then it disappeared entirely. It was gone. Of course, the two Cameron brothers, one Al Bielek today was Edward Cameron back then, and Duncan Cameron, not in this body but another body, decided the party was getting too rough. Mm -hmm. So they uh, jumped overboard. Except at that point, they didn't jump into the water. They expected to jump in the water, swim ashore, mm -hmm. and uh, you know get away from any uh, rough times. Mm -hmm. But they found themselves in a vortex that the boat was in, mm -hmm. like a wormhole in space and time, and they came out at Montauk Point in 1983, mm -hmm. August 12th. And it's debatable whether they came out above ground in a grassy field or they came out below ground in the uh, big antenna structure that was in the underground. We don't really know for sure because there is information that had both possibilities. Mm -hmm. But they ended up in 1983. So they jumped 40 years. Yeah, they jumped 40 years because the wormhole was from Philadelphia, 1943, all the way to Montauk, 1983. Mm -hmm. There was a secondary drop off in 1963 in Brentwood, New York. Mm -hmm. And the two guys found themselves in 1943, 1983. Of course, they went back and forth a number of times. Mm -hmm. So it's a very convoluted story, so it's hard to really give a quick synopsis. So they were taken from 83 and sent back to the ship. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, they went back because they, they were trying at that point. The project in 83 was running a ride. Mm -hmm. And they were trying to shut it down, but they realized it was locked in to the generators, the equipment on the boat. Mm -hmm. So somebody, we believe it was Duncan here, had to go back to the boat and smash all the generators. Al Bielik, of course, believes he was in on it. We don't know for sure. Mm -hmm. Somebody went back, smashed the generators. When the generators were smashed and the rainbow shut down, mm -hmm. the rainbow project was stopped. Then Montauk stopped, Philadelphia stopped, mm -hmm. the piece of the Montauk underground that was floating in hyperspace returned to its rightful mm -hmm. area. The Eldridge returned to Philadelphia Harbor, and all of a sudden, zoop, there it was in the Philadelphia Harbor again. Mm -hmm. Of course, they couldn't raise the Eldridge. They couldn't get anybody on the radio. Mm -hmm. You know, they would, they would get a carrier a couple of times, but uh, they weren't able to get anything that made any sense from the Eldridge, so they sent a launch out to the Eldridge to find out what happened, of course. Mm -hmm. And what they found is they found people wandering aimlessly around the deck of the ship. Mm -hmm. They found some people actually integrated into the deck of the ship with arms in, maybe a shoulder and a head sticking out. Wow. In other words, when, when the thing transition in the hyperspace if you move everything became energetic it means you could move through that wall if when it came back and was solid if you were in that wall you became part of that wall mm -hmm. because Tom Bearden talks of this theory and concept quite heavily mm -hmm. you know about putting the uh, pencil through a piece of metal and having it be integrated into the piece of metal mm -hmm. you know that's been a famous uh, accidental experiment that was done years ago that still nobody knows how to do yeah at this point but either way, the Navy saw, yes, the experiment worked. Mm -hmm. It was a tremendous success, but it also literally destroyed the mind of the men on the ship. Mm -hmm. So it was a success, but it was also a failure. So, of course, they abandoned that project, and they dumped the money into the Manhattan Project and developed the atomic bomb, bombed mm -hmm. the bejesus out of the Japanese, uh -huh. and... Okay. got us to win the war that way. Mm -hmm. In the meantime, they had won the German front essentially through psychological means mm -hmm. and just marching in with the Allies. Yeah. But there was a lot of propaganda, there were a lot of psychological stuff being used on the Germans as well. But it was easy because the Germans were also disheartened at mm -hmm. that point too. Yeah. So the war was won and it was decided, well, now we're up to 1948. You know, let's relaunch the Rainbow Project and see if we can figure out why did the men go nuts. Mm -hmm. 
So they relaunched it, split into two projects. What happened to all these men? As far as we know, they were sucked into a sane asylum, mainly. So they're probably still alive today. Some of them are still alive today. Okay. Mm -hmm. But now, let's go to 1948. Okay. They relaunched the project again. They had two phases they had to solve. They had to solve the engineering problem. They had to get the thing reproducible. Mm -hmm. And small enough that it, wasn't, it wouldn't take a battleship to hold the equipment. Mm -hmm. So that ended up went out to Los Alamos mm -hmm. Laboratory in New Mexico. And that's what we call the stealth technology today, the third level of stealth. The first is the radar cross-section that doesn't reflect much signal. The second is the uh, carbon coating that absorbs the signal. The third is the electromagnetic bottle, which was came out of the Philadelphia Experiment research. Mm -hmm. The third is somewhat known but not talked of that much. You see it referred to fleetingly in articles in trade publications and such in the aircraft world. But the other side... Which is the mag electromagnetic propulsion system? No, it's the electromagnetic Field bottle. generation. It's the field generation that makes it essentially disappear. Mm -hmm. Okay. And they can get full invisibility as well as radar invisibility with the stealth. Mm -hmm. But that's not what we're here to discuss. That mm -hmm. is a military secret, rightfully so. Mm -hmm. It's in our arsenal and it's for the defense of the United States. Mm -hmm. So we're not going to go into how that works. Mm -hmm. Now, the second part that they had to solve is they had to figure out why did the people go nuts. Mm -hmm. So they launched the human factor side. That was sent out to Brookhaven National Lab right here oh, on Long Island okay. because they had the largest mm -hmm. human factors research in the country. Mm -hmm. So that ended up out here on Long Island, that part of the project. Mm -hmm. And, of course, that was the heavier part because the other stuff was just engineering, physics and engineering yeah. to solve. Mm -hmm. You know, they already had the basis, they just had to develop it. Mm -hmm. so that was just essentially an industrial R&D project. Well, when you're saying they already had the basis, where, how did they arrive at the basis? From the Philadelphia Experiment. Okay. The how did they worked. arrive at the, how did they, why did they initiate the Philadelphia Experiment? I mean, what grounds did they have to initiate the Philadelphia Experiment? Because the Institute of Advanced Sciences had run a number of small tests and proved that the theory worked. Okay. That they made models of ships disappear. They had a test in the Brooklyn Navy Yard where they had a uh, destroyer tethered between two others, had the coils on the base of the destroyer, and all the equipment was on the other two, and they made that ship radar invisible. Okay. In other words, they had a number, there was a good series of R&D work leading up to this thing. Okay, and those technologies are being used right now in the yeah. stealth bomber. Of course, it's highly evolved and more yeah. developed, so there's something that you don't need the battleship to move around. Mm. They started out with very large generators, and uh, they got it down to where they put these things that run off of uh, propeller-driven generators so that are on the aircraft very much the way our uh, electronic countermeasures devices, and, you know, the radar jamming mm -hmm. facilities are ran. They're pods that typically sit on the airplane, although the B-1 has the equipment integrated in the airplane itself. Uh -huh. But for years, these radar jamming systems were pods that typically they hung on the end of the wings. Like an AWACS. Like an AWACS, yeah. yeah. AWACS is a uh, surveillance, you know, a radio yeah. surveillance deal. But either way, that's again, that's not what okay. we're here to discuss. Next. Now, they launched the human factors research. They actually integrated it with the Phoenix Project, which was still being carried on at the uh, Brookhaven Labs. Mm -hmm. It had taken work from MK, MK Ultra, had taken work from Wilhelm Reich, had taken work from many sectors, including the Philadelphia Experiment, and they integrated this all into one super mine research project. Mm -hmm. And they, they finally developed the stealth technology so that they could literally synthesize the Earth references that human beings needed. One of the reasons they went nuts is that the human beings need the electromagnetic background of the Earth. Mm -hmm. When that bottle was sealed, like it was, mm -hmm. on the Eldridge, open-ended just a Montauk, and it became in the vortex, the electromagnetic background that we need, the Schumann resonances, the noise background of the planet, was lost. Mm -hmm. And people went nuts because of it. They, they had no basis. They didn't know where they were. Mm -hmm. And eventually, with all the high degree of electromagnetic fields, the mine broke. 
they learn how to synthesize that background and how to concentrate the fields into a bottle. Mm -hmm. So the inside was mm -hmm. pretty much neutral and pleasant like the earth. Mm -hmm. Of course, all the final reports were written. The final report, the last couple of paragraphs spoke of that this is the first time we have definite solid evidence that the mind of man is electromagnetic and that can be influenced by electromagnetic fields from the outside mm -hmm. and that this maybe should be going into as for crowd control, military applications. Congress said no, 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 they don't want it. Mm -hmm. You know, Congress got the report on the early part of the Phoenix Project. Mm -hmm. Congress supposedly thought they uh, stopped the Phoenix Project. Is that public access information? I mean, is that it is secret FOIA? Stuff. Oh, it's not it is accessible. secret still. Mm -hmm. See, the the information comes very roundabout way from the investigation that Senator Goldwater reportedly did mm -hmm. on, the, on this work. And these guys out of Brookhaven had already built their kingdom. Mm -hmm. So they wanted to keep it going. Mm -hmm. So somebody got the idea, let's go and talk to the military direct. Mm -hmm. So they went to people in the Joint Chiefs of staff and said, hey, how would you like a weapon? You throw the switch, the enemy uh, throws up their hands and, uh, and surrenders. Mm -hmm. Of course, you know, it was, yeah, 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 I'd love that weapon. Mm -hmm. So they said, well, we can develop it. We have some, uh, we have a start on it, but we got to do it in secrecy. Of course, the military was already quite familiar with secrecy. Mm -hmm. So it was launched as a black hole project. And the military suggested, well, you can't do it. You know, they said, we can't do it at Brookhaven Labs mm -hmm. because we're too much under scrutiny of the political government. Mm -hmm. You got any ideas of where we could do the research? We want to be close to Brookhaven Labs, Princeton, and MIT. Mm -hmm. So they said, well, we got this old Air Force base that's now deserted on the eastern tip of Long Island, Montauk Air Force Base. Mm -hmm. It's a small town. There isn't a lot of people in it. You can go out there and be pretty much secluded. Back then in the early 70s, mm -hmm. this was like 1969, 1970, I have to add to it. Mm -hmm. It was really, it was a small, sleepy little town. It wasn't big. Mm -hmm. It wasn't the vacation capital yet at that point. So the group said, great, that sounds like an excellent place. Okay, and we're at what year now? This is now about 72. Okay. It was decided to move it all out to the old Montauk Air Force Base. Okay. They went out there, they masqueraded as uh, Air Force personnel. They brought some Air Force personnel in also at the mm -hmm. same time. And they reactivated the old SAGE radar because it transmitted on the same frequency range that Wilhelm Wright used for his organ studies. Mm -hmm. So it was decided to refurbish the old SAGE transmitter. It was there, it was usable. So they got the Air Force personnel in and refurbished it. Then they contracted with the company BJM that I used to work for, and I went out. I started to modify it, and you know, make what, it. What is BJM specifically? It's a uh, military-industrial contract that we made radar jamming equipment. Okay. So what's and your background? A, I'm essentially an electrical engineer. Okay. I have a BS degree, mm -hmm. and uh, I, my specialty was essentially receivers. Okay. As you can see, these are all receivers. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm a fanatic on receivers and radio gear. Mm -hmm. So I was taken out and I was, my job was to modify the big old radar transmitter for this special purpose. Mm -hmm. It started out with what we call the microwave oven experiments, where they just took a human being, stuck him in the building, focused the big antenna on him, pumped out a hundred million watts of power in, hooked the people in that radar beam. Mm -hmm. And they got it to the point where they could actually type in a command to the computer, and the computer would pulse the transmitter, and the person would do it to some extent. Mm. Then, so they were group, triggering mechanisms in in the brain. Don't know if it's the computer? brain direct or the psyche. See, here we're getting to the question: Is is your intelligence in the brain, or is it some? quantum function that's outside the brain. I personally believe the brain is a computer interface and that your intelligence is outside the brain. Because oh. there are documentation yeah. of a number of people existing without a brain. <laughs> or with, you know, sorry, being brain dead. <laughs> now don't laugh so much. <laughs> to continue on the Montauk story, they had developed the microwave oven experiment to the point where 
they got to, you know, they could type in a command, they could get the person to, to act like a chicken or whatever it is. Mm -hmm. Of course, Duncan here was one of those research people that they hit with this. Mm -hmm. Why someone didn't realize that, that this would burn out the person's brain, I don't know. Clock. Clock. And <laughs> it was finally realized, well, if we turn the antenna around, the non-physical energetic component go through the antenna and the burning rays would be reflected off into the atmosphere. Of course, they had to route jets away because they shot down a few jets possibly with mm -hmm. this thing. You have 100 megawatts of power going out in the air and the airplane flies too close. It's going to knock out all its avionics equipment. Mm -hmm. But that was, that, was easily, that was easily to be arranged. In fact, that can be documented today that the old SAGE site in the 70s was off limits of airplanes. Mm -hmm especially east of the SAGE site. By SAGE site you're referring to? The Montauk base. Okay. <clears throat> they didn't know where you would run into the UHF beam that would wipe out uh, mm -hmm. avionics on the airplane. Well, the alien beam from the 400 megahertz blast, that's another story. <laughs> and it's also off limits today after 4 o'clock and there are no aircraft yeah. warning lights on, on the, the four aircraft. There are no aircraft warning lights on the transmitter power and it's uh, we've been told it's, oh. it's off limits after I believe four o'clock in the afternoon. Really? Hmm. That's when they it's that's right. when they turn on the existing equipment that they're still using. But go fits. Yeah. they realized that they had a system which they were able to enter the mind of a human being by typing in computer commands. Now at the same time this group had heard of some of the alien interchange, the alien research they heard that the aliens had a chair deal, that you could sit a human being in and it would read out everything that's in his mind. Mm -hmm. Of course, they were very interested to interface that into the computer. Mm -hmm. You know, hey, we had a computer that could take thoughts and make them real, manifest them. So what they wanted to be able to do was sit Duncan in a chair, have him concentrate on Tom Tulleen here. Mm -hmm. Tom Tulleen acts like a chicken, and Duncan would work, visualize create in his mind a virtual reality where Tom Tulleen is acting like a chicken. This would go through the computers, go out the transmitter, it would spread out, would find Tom like a radionics that would, you know, converge on Tom, mm -hmm. and Tom would be compelled to act like a chicken. Mm -hmm. This is essentially what they did. They made essentially a mind amplifier. There would be enough horsepower to overtake a person's normal defense system. Mm -hmm. and the person would become subjective to the, the format, the work duty that was presented. Mm -hmm. They'd be controlled. But is it your mind interfacing with my mind? Yes, or is it some collective mind? It's, uh, and it, would be, it would be an artificial presentation of uh, instructions to do work which would integrate with... With my mind, with my, func my normal electrical functions in my brain? Uh, your brain, your auric field, your mm -hmm. spirit, soul, and if it's strong enough... And, and so it's more on a, on a level of energy, physical yeah. energy, not... Absolutely. It's, it's more nothing physical. Yes. Energetic action. slash electromagnetic, mm -hmm. which in this reality form are highly structured and, and based into, for mm -hmm. sure. Mm -hmm. Interesting. So you finished, Duncan? <laughs> to continue. <laughs> yes, he's not finished con you know, completely. No. <laughs> but to continue... They develop a mind amplifier where a person such as Duncan, who's been trained in a virtual reality project, mm -hmm. something very similar to the Lawnmower Man movie, mm -hmm. would be trained to actually visualize something and create in his mind a full, complete physical reality known as a virtual reality. Mm -hmm. He would be sat in that chair. The radio equipment, the computer equipment, the transmitter equipment would pick up that virtual reality Mm -hmm. by a group of coils and different kinds of sensors. We'll go to a massive computer bank. The computer will align it, stabilize it, you know, all that good stuff, control mm -hmm. it, store it. The uh, computer would then feed it to the actual radar transmitter, mm -hmm. which would transmit out electromagnetic equivalent of what we call a thought form in the metaphysics mm -hmm. field and transmit this thought form out at lots and lots of CW power. Mm -hmm. We believe today the CW power output of the Montour project was in the order of 100 megawatts or 100 million watts, mm -hmm. and the pulse power was up in the terawatts. 
they'll terrorize people. Mm -hmm. But terrorists. But they needed something the to control it as well. So they must have been using a computer system. Yes, very advanced. Very advanced. They use a Cray One computer feeding. They use multiple Cray computers for multiple chairs mm -hmm. feeding an IBM 360 or 370, the biggest one IBM had. Mm -hmm. and then this fed a very specialized uh, radar computer that was built by AIO in Long Island. Mm -hmm. that interface to the actual transmitter and controlled the pulse modulation, the frequency hopping of the transmitter. Mm -hmm. And then we went out through all the stages, above ground first and underground, back above ground to the big antenna, mm -hmm. and transmitted out the big antenna. Mm -hmm. What they noticed is this thing had enough power they could actually materialize things. Mm -hmm. Notice if Duncan could form something in his mind. This thing had the power to actually bring it into physical reality and materialize. Through the system at the end of the process it yeah. would occur. It could actually, if he thought of a can of beer, it could create that can of beer and you could drink wow. it. See, he was trained to actually visualize something in its entirety. Mm -hmm. And what they were experimenting with was precipitating or materializing objects around the base. Mm -hmm. A favorite was a can of Budweiser beer on the base commander's desk. <laughs> the base commander liked Bud. <laughs> so they showed picture. Duncan a picture of the base commander's desk in his office, and he would visualize in his virtual reality a can of Budweiser beer sitting on that desk. Mm -hmm. Sure enough, it would appear on that desk. Mm -hmm. And the guy could drink it and it didn't poison him or anything. Mm -hmm. He said it was very good. It was better than typical Bud was. Oh, really? Yeah. <laughs> so, but they noticed a peculiarity here. Something very peculiar was happening. He might concentrate at 3 o'clock in the afternoon. The key in the beer might appear 8 o'clock in the morning to 8 o'clock at mm -hmm. night, anywhere in that, that stretch. Mm -hmm. It would be out of real time. So it was realized, hey, this thing will bend time. Mm -hmm. Of course, they got all excited over that. And they sent the whole group of us technical scientific people out to study time. They told us, learn everything you can about time, how to control it, what it is. Mm -hmm. This was like 78, 1979. By 1981, we had modified the system so we had a working time tunnel, a working time portal. Mm -hmm. Duncan here, and we think there may have been one other psychic used for the time. Duncan here has multiple time references, and which he can speak on in a bit, because we're almost to the end of the project, mm -hmm. where he could actually visualize another time, and he would have a personal connection through these multiple time connections mm -hmm. to actually visualize that exact time that he was trying to visualize. Mm -hmm. it means if he visualized uh, 1800, Mm -hmm. Let's say France, Paris, France, 1800 on a street corner. Mm -hmm. His mind had a virtual image, a virtual reality image created of that street corner in mm -hmm. Paris in 1800. Mm -hmm. And if they picked that out, it would make a connection, first energetic and then physical, to that point in France in 1800. Would it occur? It would occur. In, a, actually in a limited space in wherever it chooses to? Uh -huh. Is it controllable in terms of where it occurs? Whatever he could concentrate on, that's how tightly they could control it. And they actually, so you could make it appear at a specific place? Yes. Okay. They used the master 19... You're talking about the holodeck on the, start, <laughs> on the Enterprise. But yeah. more advanced. <laughs> yeah. Because the holodeck yeah. would not actually send you to 1800. Yeah. Not physically, it would recreate 1800. Yeah. You'd be walking into a virtual reality. Wow. The Duncan's mind would create the holodeck function that the computers on the Star Trek created. Then the big transmitter would actually make it physical and real. Mm -hmm. It was first started out that they could view it and display it on a TV screen. Mm -hmm. Then once they got where they wanted, then they could record it, extend it, and they could make an actual opening from the present to whatever time they're So you're not create, it's not creating anything, it's just realizing what's there yeah. already. Sure. Ma making yeah. an attachment yeah. to mm -hmm. it. So in a sense, to it. all time is occurring at the same time as what well said. the result of that okay, experiment. Of course, of course, to make a long story short, they then cleared everybody off the base. 
brought in a super elite secret group to do the time research. That's when they're starting to muck around and monkey with time itself. Mm -hmm. Of course, we can go into umpteen billion different stories here of what they could have done and what they did. Mm -hmm. So, you know, then of course, at the end of the project, in August 12, 1983, they made the connections slightly earlier. The two guys came from 43 to 83. The project's locked up. They created this huge vortex between 83 and 43. It was decided maybe early July, I mean late July, early August of mm -hmm. 1983, that what was being done out at Montauk was not for the best. Mm -hmm. You know, some people were starting to get cold feet. Mm -hmm. You know, they were starting to get scared, to be honest with you. There was meetings held privately among the Why? Group. Because the technologies were so advanced that none of the interim... This group was monkeying around with time. Mm -hmm. They could go back and change the life of Christ if they wanted. Mm -hmm. It was getting very concerning, very scary. Mm -hmm. After a number of meetings privately between the people inside, not the management of Montauk, but the workers, it was decided this project had to crash. Mm -hmm. And who so, made that decision? I don't know for sure. Mm -hmm. I don't know who made it. What society the project had to crash? We were going to bring down the project by putting into Duncan a command that when we said the time is now, to bring up into his conscious mind a monster from the subconscious. A Bigfoot, essentially. So, August 12, 1983, he went into a chair, turned on, he was connecting, we don't even know where he was connecting to at that point, what space and time. But along about four in the afternoon, I believe it was myself, I went into the chair room, opened up the mic into the chair room and said, the time is now, the time is now. At that point, Duncan cleared out the virtual he had already created and brought up this monster from his subconscious. Mm -hmm. And of course, it became physical and real, and we call it Junior. Mm -hmm. It started to stomp around, it was, it was angry, it was mad, it was hungry, it was frightened, it, you know. It brought out of his subconscious mind. Next thing you know, it's it's, it's in a he's in a area he's not familiar with. He's mm -hmm. very mean and nasty. He's making a lot of noise, smashing things. And at that point, it was decided by the project director the project had to be stopped. Mm -hmm. We went down to the tr the power station and pulled the switches to the radar building. Mm -hmm. Only thing is, nothing happened. It didn't stop. Mm -hmm. So my next thought is, uh, holy Moses, the uh, Navy and Air Force techs must have got the wiring on the ground all messed up. Mm -hmm. So it was decided, okay, uh, we didn't want to go pull the switches because we weren't sure what was going to happen. So we decided I put on a set of acetylene tanks, you know, a cutting torch, mm -hmm. you know, small torch you wear on your back. Mm -hmm. And I went into the transformer yard, the substation next to the transmitter building. And I cut the wires coming up out of the ground mm -hmm. with the torch. And I had insulation and such so I wouldn't get shocked. And all the lights went on in the base. That damn transmitter kept running. Mm -hmm. So then I was saying to Jack, that's the base, you know, the head of the project, you gonna go in there? And he said, no, you're gonna go in there. I said, no, you're gonna go in there. None of us wanted to go inside the mm -hmm. building. Because there was all sorts of discharge, there was all sorts of wild stuff going on inside the building at that point. You could open the door, look in, and it looked like St. Elmo's fire everywhere, and there were glowing masses on the, you know, even the first floor. Mm -hmm. So finally, uh, I don't know, I don't remember what was at gunpoint or whatever, I was, shall we say, persuaded mm -hmm. to go in and start taking it down inside the building. Mm -hmm. So I first went and pulled the wiring out that went up to the transmitter. Because we thought maybe, I thought maybe the, the wiring is still messed up and I didn't cut the actual line. Mm -hmm. So I knew this box up behind the main panel, power panel, had the three phase 440 or 1600 that went up to the uh, drivers. Mm -hmm. We knew once we got the drivers down, the amplifiers down below, which you couldn't get anywhere near, would mm -hmm. shut down. Mm -hmm. They were primed, they were set, so that if the input signal stopped to those amplifiers for more than 10 seconds, they just shut off entirely, powered down, mm -hmm. and was ready to have the water pumped out and that sort of thing. I pulled those wires out. The lights went out in the building, but I could still hear everything humming upstairs. Mm -hmm. So I say, oh, these damn techs. 
They don't know what the hell they're doing. The electricians are messed up for everything. Now I gotta go upstairs. So I'm climbing up through the muck and mire and the discharge and the alternate realities and all that nonsense. Get up to the first transmitter floor and I start trying to shut stuff off, shut down. I can't even touch the consoles. Mm -hmm. I get burned when I touch the consoles. So I decide, okay, upstairs is the master power control mm -hmm. for the two transmitters. You know, the first and the second transmitter floor. Mm -hmm. So I said, okay, I'm going to go up to the second floor and I'm going to cut that whole master power thing apart. Mm -hmm. I cut it apart. It was still running, but now you could hear everything was out of sequence, out of phase. Mm. It was making funny growling noises. I actually had to go into the Amplitron rooms and cut the waveguides apart, go into the Amplitron. Mm. To this day, you can see torch marks where the power sw control switches were. Mm -hmm. And you can see torch marks in the Amplitron's room by the Amplitron. And at that point, when I cut the Amplitrons apart, everything stopped humming. The discharging reduced, and I knew, okay, we finally shut this goddamn thing off. Mm -hmm. And I went out. Of course, most of the people were gone. You know, Junior was 30 foot tall or 10 foot tall, depending upon how much brown mush you had in your pants. <laughs> and by then, most everybody had gone AWOL or run out, you know, run for their, for their life. And there was maybe myself and two others, so we fled. And I went through debriefing. They played the time wraparound number, which, you know, is a long story, so I wouldn't mm -hmm. remember in those. They made sure I didn't remember what I did. I actually had worked two jobs. Mm -hmm. But, uh, you know, unless you're really interested. But essentially, yeah. he was debriefed, released back into the public. I was debriefed, released back into the public. We went on about our regular normal lives. And that's the end of the story. Mm -hmm. So now you can go into questions. Um. Were you, I mean, when you were debriefed, were you re, uh, required to, to, an oath, an oath, to an oath of silence? No, because you were they never in the military. This, no. Yeah. They did this through mind control means. Both Duncan and I were, and Al, were debriefed through mind control means. We were just made to forget it. Mm -hmm. And did you? I did until I started to work with a time transducer myself and had time currents flowing through me. Mm -hmm. Once I had the time currents flowing through me, I passed out up on the roof when I came back. All of a sudden, I saw to remember everything. Mm -hmm. Up on the roof of this building is an antenna, very similar, a small edition of what they built out at Montauk for the main time antenna. We call it the Delta T antenna, mm -hmm. or Delta Time. It's uh, three loops built on the Delta, you know, an X, mm -hmm. a Y, and a Z. Mm -hmm. And mathematically, you can do wild things if you drive all three loops correctly, you can actually create time vortexes, time distortions, and such if you know how to do it. Mm -hmm. You also have to have a electric field antenna above the delta T. Mm -hmm. And I, I was building one of these things. I wasn't aware of what I was building. I was trying to build a shielded loop antenna to use for VLF and ELF, because in this area, VLF is useless on a long wire antenna, which is what's usually used. So what mm -hmm. you pick up is loco 60 hertz background. Mm -hmm. So I was trying to probe into the magnetic fields, not the electric fields. I was building a shielded magnetic loop mm -hmm. to hook up to my ELF receiver here. Mm -hmm. And uh, I considered the cheapest, easiest way for me to build this antenna. Somehow, I came up with the Delta T design. Because the Delta T design is a shielded loop. Mm -hmm. And I built the thing on the roof because I wanted to listen to VLF and ELF. And I noticed I had like 40 turns in each winding. Each loop had 40 turns. I had to sit there with an ohm meter and actually buzz them out to find which wire here goes mm -hmm. to the wire here. And I, I had to hold the wires, you know, to put the probes of the ohm meter on them. And then I solder it to the terminal board. Each time I find a loop, I solder it, I solder it. I found I could only do this for about 20 minutes, and then I feel very fatigued, very tired, floating, funny. And, you know, so I'd only do it for 20 minutes at a time. One day, I had a storm, you know, a nice big storm coming up on the horizon. Mm -hmm. I had the relay canister open. So I wanted to finish that relay canister, seal it up with the gook and putty and such before the storm came. Mm -hmm. So I pushed myself. After about an hour, I got to feel so weird, I just passed out. When I woke up, when well, it was raining, mm -hmm. of course, 
First thing I thought, oh my God, it's raining. So I had to throw some plastic tarp over the relays. And I was sitting there realizing, I saw how to have scenes of Montauk flashing through my mind. Mm. I, I then, for the next couple of nights, dreamed of Montauk heavily, except I was there. Mm. Up to that point, I never believed I was there. Mm -hmm. Now I thought back, remembered how many people were there, remembered me. You know, I have guys walk up to me, hey, what have you been doing, blah, blah, blah. And I say, do I know you? Mm -hmm. I say, sure, we've met. I say, where do I know you from? Well, I work with you at Montauk. Mm -hmm. You work with me at Montauk, all of a sudden he, he clammed up. Mm -hmm. Well, he realized I didn't remember it. He realized he didn't know no. Mm -hmm. So some of the military people, they knew some of us were on their oath and were fully conscious, some of us weren't. Mm -hmm. My cousin married a guy that was stationed out there. He swore he remembered me. Mm -hmm. And the family thought he was cracked. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so little by little, over a couple of months, I pulled back my memories. Mm -hmm. So you were a part of the second part of the project, and the first. How did you, how did you get involved <coughs> initially into that? Um, you were part of the first. Yeah, in the in the um, what's called the psychic signature or the mm -hmm. uh, Matthews function, which is a particular uh, particular sense of frequency individual to the person as in a thumbprint. Mm -hmm. uh, everyone has a particular signature. Um, uh, what I'm kind of have been struggling with is which typically came first. Um, if you follow the chronology of time, obviously the 40s prior the 80s. Um, that doesn't mean that actually was the case. Mm -hmm. um, some of the information that I get from reading, I've been trained esoterically, um, initially by the NSA in the 70s. Mm -hmm. um, to be able to project my own sense of um, essence to a particular point and make a reference mm -hmm. and then feedback certain information. Um, some of my readings uh, inside, in other words, an adjustment with myself into different esoteric zones, something like the Kashik on the esoteric zone, which is something that is um, have, that most people use for long-term memory. Mm -hmm. There are more different zones, elaborate, evolved, and such and some of the information comes back that the part of my recall in the 40s is because it has not fully happened to me yet which I, mm. I wonder as to why and what that actually means mm. um, but if you follow the chronology sake obviously the 40s prior to the 80s mm -hmm. um, as to how this whole phenomenon occurred regarding me that's a good question don't really know per se mm -hmm. Uh, other than that, in the um, I was volunteered by my father. Mm -hmm. uh, this is back in <coughs> basic, uh, basically 1939. Mm -hmm. uh, of course, there's a difference in age here. I'm, I'm 41 as I sit, and it's, mm -hmm. it's a physical impossibility to be X amount of years back in the 40s and still be 40 years of age. Mm -hmm. um, that's a, a different story having to do with. Uh, actually transplanting the soul into a different body, per se, without going through the typical um, incarnate process that mm -hmm. in, in metaphysics that's a standard uh, uh, phenomenon occurs. So you're not in the same vessel you were born in? That's correct. Okay. The, the original vessel was uh, 1917 in Germany. Mm -hmm. uh, um, Al was born in 1918 or 16? Something like that something I, I forget whatever time that was uh yeah we were volunteered um uh, for reasons. was your father in the service uh he was in the navy for a number of years mm -hmm. uh was in and out of the navy and coast guard mm -hmm. Auxiliary coast guard and um uh, al has a picture of him which i question uh mostly i question because i don't recall i'm not saying it is mm -hmm. not valid just my own recall i don't have a connection Mm -hmm. with this picture that he is uh, training the crew of the uh, the Eldridge mm -hmm. uh, up in Groton, Connecticut, I think it is. Somewhere up in there. Coast mm -hmm. Guard Academy. Oh, yes? But that is in with your father's photographs. Sure. 
So it, it could very well be valid, I just don't recall it myself. Mm -hmm. um, he's another kind of interesting story in the sense that he was connected almost worldwide for reasons not really known other than that he grew up in money mm -hmm. and there was money in the family to do sort of as he, as he pleased. Mm -hmm. um, um, getting back a little bit to the Philadelphia process, um, some of my uh, information comes through trance mm -hmm. um, and it's, it's part of the mind which I'm told that uh, will not lie, whatever mm -hmm. that means. This is according to psychological and, and the, um, <coughs> the uh, psychologist and the psychiatrist form of identification. Mm -hmm. um, uh, under trance, I came up with something or had access to information saying that during this Philadelphia process, there were three UFOs that I saw in my sighting in, in looking up in my esoteric view of things that were around the area at the time. Mm -hmm. And one of them was actually pulled in as this whole phenomenon of energy started to move and mm -hmm. ended up in a, in a what typically was a vortex pattern, a swirling type of mm -hmm. energetic like a black cone. Mm -hmm. yeah, it could be. Black hole's somewhat little different, but it's, it's that sense of. Mm -hmm. And actually got pulled in and ended up in Montauk. Mm -hmm. And through the number of years it actually um, did evolve and s basically started to appear in its infancy, what did we figure, early 50s or something like that? Oh, the 60s. Early 50s? Mm -hmm. Okay, well, between early 50s and early 60s. Mm -hmm. And then started to uh, materialize. Mm -hmm. And of course, th there's some interest and speculation saying that uh, this is partially why that the base was, was of interest and all these um, uh, buildings were built around it and such, mm -hmm. and that through the years it actually came to fruition. And um, so that's um, that's part of Al Felix, um, who Al co-authored a book with Rod Steiger. Brad Steiger. Rod, mm -hmm. Rod Steiger. Brad, yeah. Brad Steiger. Sure. Mm -hmm. uh, that's one of his uh, considerations, as indeed this whole process of opening this uh, hole in in, in space-time was to uh, was contrived and it was mm -hmm. ET um, considered mm -hmm. and this is what they directed the scientists to come up with this drop-dead date of August 12, 1943 to have this experimentation and it had to be fired up and done at this particular time mm -hmm. and of course that um, some of Preston's work he has correlated uh, this August 12th uh, runs in a 20-year cycle, a biorhythmic mm -hmm. cycle of the Earth, mm -hmm. where this, there is a, a peaking out of this information, sort of like a resonance. Mm -hmm. um, and that goes along, all these bits of information seem to hold together. Mm -hmm. uh, let's see, right. So... How about in the aspect of the experiments that dealt in mind manipulation? I mean. To what extent were you, what was your involvement in that? Um, well, recently I've, I've come to kind of an understanding and settling that um, the process of this connection, certainly metaphysics, time is, is all connected. The past, present, future is inter interconnected. And those people who can access it uh, more than the typical sense that everyone does or, or, or psychic or sensitive or have capabilities. Uh, there's an electromagnetic connection. Sure. Yeah. Sure. You're very ma much electromagnetic that based um, here. Being involved in the Philadelphia experiment in this uh, time phenomenon and jumping, um, jumping and right along the, the time framework for which we're we're now involved in here, mm -hmm. um, I would uh, have the potential capabilities to do the psychic work on, on a bigger. Um, bigger potential than most people would. Mm -hmm. So coming from the 40s into the 80s um, and then having to process one of the times that for some reason I lost my time reference and the age, the body aged very dramatically and ended up for some reason back in the 60s. Uh, for reasons I guess it makes sense it was we figured in, within that 20 year cycle of 43, mm -hmm. 63, 83 and um, and curiously enough, there's all sorts of tests that Preston has where, where um, 
uh, he and I can validate um, consideration of things that I, I do know and, and mm -hmm. figure as, as a reference of sort. In early 60s, I don't identify with much of everything. Mm -hmm. It goes along with the, the half a dozen or five or six different memories I have before the age of, of 13. That are all different? Or Sorry? what? No. no, it's just basic uh, memories of childhood that mm -hmm. uh, are just not there mm -hmm. for reasons not known. Okay. Um, but the, the process of what Preston earlier spoke about, these random um, thought processes that occur in different aspects of time, mm -hmm. as with the, the uh, can of beer, mm -hmm. um, it would be a natural phenomenon for the psyche, which had been um, actually exposed to the esoteric in a broader way than most people, mm -hmm. to almost play, go out, take a job and just see what happens, put it out, as in, in the, um, supposedly the evolution of the human spirit to mm -hmm. go into these different realms which the human spirit does have a con natural connection to, all these alternate and mm -hmm. the timeline and stuff. But to, um, you know, given a work duty, just kind of uh, do it on an, almost an experimental, the, the creation aspect of it without being contained. Mm -hmm. And therefore, the uh, kind of the advent of the, um, the time experiments, mm -hmm. uh, which ended up um, in certainly the the mundane to the uh the phenomenon of of, of going and and jumping planets mm -hmm. and moving into different time zones of which as i say it's a natural occurrence that everyone has mm -hmm. and the, the, that yeah, we haven't realized everyone does yeah. yeah the human spirit is is so very connected and supposedly that's some of the um interest of the et groups mm -hmm. that the the, the human spirit that we're evolving in this process has such a uh, um, vast number of emotions mm -hmm. uh, with it in the love I hate you. It, mm -hmm. It's so very evident in a child mm -hmm. in that they don't understand that. It's mm -hmm. so very extreme in nature. Mm -hmm. And of course that that ex extremity is, is part of creation mm -hmm. in that that hopping back between the two points, there's all sorts of rooms for room for uh, doing work and, and such. So, mm -hmm. um, one of the um, unusual characteristics in, in the, this jumping in time and, and seeing uh, where the particular special interest groups, and that's basically what Montauk mm -hmm. was about, very specialized interest groups within right. the government, mm -hmm. outside, mm -hmm. um, uh, finding a way to accentuate and to, to gear and maneuver their own sense of for the, whatever their, their mm -hmm. agenda is. Um, there was a test at Montauk for those people who could sense in this time framework, which we're all moving along, mm -hmm. to the year 6037. Mm -hmm. Sounds kind of kooky and, and, and bizarre and, and unusual, but we all have a connection to our evolution. Mm -hmm. and, and that's supposedly one of most the most evolved states of the human spirit mm -hmm. in the time framework of it moving along. Mm -hmm. Everyone has a connection to it and there is enough kind of horsepower mm -hmm. or, or a process to move it in that area then could be on paper um, connected mm -hmm. and um, it probably was a, a probably was a bit of a, a, a jolt and such but they had these connections and Part of the, the work duties of some of these uh, volunteers were to go in and sense this this uh, horse on a pedestal, mm -hmm. uh, which in this kind of surrealistic city, um, and some of the people had the uh, had the creativity and the um, how do we say and the ability to actually ride the horse, mm -hmm. get on this horse, and then follow it and see where it ended up. Mm -hmm. um, and it, it, from reports, it ended up uh, before Christ, millions of years. Mm -hmm. And along that pathway, they had a number of what's called uh, flag posts, which for some reason has been uh, connected with me. I don't quite know why, but th there is my essence in connection with these flag posts. 
Uh, markers, a lot markers, of markers in time. Mm -hmm. sa same thing. Mm -hmm. um, and we're we're speculating. We certainly don't know because we're still trying to grab memories and see what what comes up. Mm -hmm. And by all means, uh, Al Bielek, uh, my half brother, is is part of this this investigation. Mm -hmm. We're trying to figure, put it all together as to what these references in time in mm -hmm. time means. Mm -hmm. And the logical aspect is that the control group would, would like to use these forms for their agenda. It's, it's a logical format. Mm -hmm. um, so that, that was one of the peculiar aspects of it. The, some of the other unfortunate uh, considerations were the use of, of, of boys mm -hmm. in the project. What age? Uh, ooh, <laughs> goes back to five and six at the earliest, maybe seven and eight, uh, p through pubescent into 17 and 18. And they had some 20-year-olds at the time. And how were they used? They were used in, in researching um, their connection into uh, the natural connection into ESP mm -hmm. and, and, and where it went involved. And what's um, um, kind of interesting and, and sad is that um, recently I've, I've come to the conclusion, and it's certainly always been there, mm -hmm that a person's uh, sexuality and ESP mm -hmm. travels the same uh, mm -hmm. avenue. Uh, we're not necessarily talking about the physical aspect of it, but the energetic mm -hmm. part of it. Mm -hmm. um, as with a, a person who, let's say, damns everything in sight, mm -hmm. they would be somewhat cloistered and onto themselves instead of forgiving and, mm -hmm. and and almost talking to trees sort of thing to be corny. Mm -hmm. that, that flow mm -hmm. of energy and, and mm -hmm. graciousness um, is, is part of what the group at Montauk were, were researching. My role has been to write the book mm -hmm. and to you know tell the story, which is an incredible story, help Preston tell the story in writing, which mm -hmm. is a, and uh, Duncan's story as well, which is a very incredible story. Now, there's also the role of verifying what they say, as is humanly possible, and in addition to that, finding out, you know, what other strange, you know, what is an objective look at this story. Mm -hmm. And a lot of the information is not easy to objectivize for the simple reason that some, much of it comes from uh, witnesses that Preston has interviewed for a period of over, you know, something like ten years or something like that and strange experiences and mm -hmm. he's not perhaps chronicled them as you know it's that he's not a journalist he's mm -hmm. an investigator and a you know paranormal engineer mm -hmm. now I think what some of the interesting things are that are an objective look is that uh, there's been at least three eyewitness accounts of stealth airplanes hovering over the Montauk base mm -hmm. actually hovering without making any noise mm -hmm. a hovercraft would make a substantial amount of noise uh, this would appear to be some sort of anti-gravity. Specifically a stealth? Stealth airplanes. The size of the B-bomber or does it have any connection to the boomerang style? I don't know enough about the different types of stealth, yeah. but it would be a, definitely, from what I've been told, a stealth airplane. One mm -hmm. of these was a local, uh, one of them was a friend of mine who happens to be a clairvoyant, Maria Fix. Other lady, uh, and she was with another person uh, who saw this. Mm -hmm. the, uh, another townsperson, Carol Brady, uh, out there. She's a real estate agent in, in Montauk. She saw a stealth airplane um, and was not surprised uh, at all. She also uh, has three boys who are blue-eyed and blonde hair and she was very well aware that they were kidnapping people who were blue-eyed and blonde hair as late as I think 88 mm -hmm. and uh, the, she said the police were involved, they knew about this and uh, so this is a, another substantiation of Preston's story from a totally independent source. There's also uh, Preston after the book was written, he proceeded to introduce me to different people who have had various involvements in one way or another. One of the more interesting was a, a man who had uh, worked as a contractor in the underground at Montauk in the 70s. Mm -hmm. He went down there and serviced the amplitrons. He saw, I think, 20 or oh. tw 24 amplitrons underground, mm -hmm. and he serviced them. He's a, a nuclear physicist, and he said there's no reason on Earth you would want amplitrons down there to amplify uh, sage radar signals or transmissions, there's no reason for it mm -hmm. uh, unless they're doing something awfully strange or unusual. So, so that's a, a very interesting piece of information. Also, his 
his assistant said that he had seen an antenna that had been serviced. This was in, I think, 1990 or thereabouts, an uh, antenna in the transmitter building that was actually clean and serviced with a tag. Mm -hmm. um, there was also the, the woman, the real estate agent told me that she'd seen, she said they were using that SAGE radar uh, out there and because she, she would see the uh, big reflector moving. Now mm -hmm. Preston said there's no way that reflector could move. On further investigation, uh, this physicist's assistant said that this, there is a hand crank and it was recently greased so mm -hmm. that you can actually, because uh, the the motor, yeah, the motor is dead to the reflector, oh, but you can actually manually. hand mm -hmm. manually hand crank this radar reflector. So she she was uh, quite satisfied that that thing had been being used. Mm -hmm. Now, well, the motors are actually missing. Oh yeah, the crank that oh. ran the reflector. Right, and there's there's all other stories. Uh, one of the the local historian out there had told me of an uh, instance of him going to the base and seeing. Uh, he, and this is in 72, he brought a friend of his back from lunch to the base where it was heavily patrolled with uh, people with, you know, soldiers with guns and one of the soldiers put a gun as they drove up to the inner gate right on his three-year-old son. Mm -hmm. He told him to remove it from his son and then he pointed it right at, at him. Mm -hmm. This is a, you know, highly irregular behavior for a, what was considered in a federal aviation or at the FAA radar facility. Mm -hmm. So so there are many stories that would definitely corroborate that there was a secret mm -hmm. uh, project of a highly secure nature and highly debatable nature as, as to whether it had any validity. And perhaps uh, we had shown you some pictures earlier of the uh, uh, programming room on the base. Now the mm -hmm. programming room uh, what this was is we just recently uh, discovered this. This is a room with, uh, one is a psychedelic room with graffiti looking stuff that's painted in a pattern by an artist. Mm -hmm. Another one is a black and white room. Another one is a paisley room. And then there's a leopard striped room, which uh, reminds, reminds us of the Timothy Leary experiments in the 60s. This could have been going on in the 60s. Um, so this is like uh, very hard evidence that something of an irregular nature was going on at the base. Mm -hmm. And as I'm saying, uh, we've also had uh, Helga Morrow contact us. Helga is a, is a woman whose father was involved in the Philadelphia and Montauk projects. Helga, uh, her father, his name was Frederick Cuppers. She has uh, evidence that her father did not die in, I think it was 62, like uh, mm -hmm. was believed, because the hair on his hands was inconsistent with the man's in the coffin. And um, she was surrounded by trench-coated men at the time as well. So she, she uh, came here and visited us and there was a lot of interesting collaboration with her mm -hmm. and uh, Preston and Duncan. But, uh, and she can go on ad infinitum about this. Mm -hmm. So I think that, uh, you know, my main, basically what I have to say is there's, there's a lot to what's backing up their story. Mm -hmm. uh, whether or not we can prove the time is, that's difficult. Mm -hmm. But that will come hopefully in time. It's just like, so that's basically why I'm here is to add some credibility to what they're saying, not mm -hmm. to swallow their story, but to, uh, there's something here that warrants investigation and mm -hmm. further investigation, and that's what my role is in, uh, as I say, writing the first book, we're working on a second book, and also mm -hmm. publishing a newsletter to further inform people on what we are finding. And I think we're going to be um, very, very, we're going to have a lot more stuff coming, I can guarantee mm -hmm. you that. Essentially, what they would do is they would go out into the public. They first look for street whites. They were interested mainly in blonde, blue-eyed boys. They centered on the ages of maybe 10 to 16, 17. Although, as Duncan pointed out, they went a lot younger, a lot older. Mm -hmm. And what they were doing with these boys, outside the research end of it, well, they had multiple, multiple parts of the, <clears throat> of the project. They would take these boys and they would essentially indoctrinate them, mm -hmm. and they would whip them to within an inch of their life, mm -hmm. you know, bestiality, brutality. The idea was they wanted to break the mind. 
when the mind was broken at that extreme point of fear, there were two things they were interested in. There had to be an alien connection into this because there's reports of some sort of technological device that would gather the patterns of fear. Hmm. There's also reports that there were some hormones removed from the bodies hmm. after the height of fear point. Secondly, they would electromagnetically capture the mind patterns that were released from the body. Hmm. They were stored in a big computer system. Hmm. They would manipulate and redesign the mind, literally redesign it. Then they would use the transmitter and put that mind, that new mind, back into the body through a human psychic adept who would like reinstall it through mm -hmm. psychosexual means. Now, the reason they picked Duncan for this is he's blonde, blue-eyed, the whole nine yards of it. Mm -hmm. So they had to pick blonde, blue-eyed people because part of Duncan's mind would become part of the boy's mind. It means mm -hmm. the boy would have a third his original mind third of his mind would be computer oriented and the other third would be based upon the the personality consciousness of the transmitter system Duncan and anyone else that had an input to it mm -hmm. and they would uh, want to pick the mind so two-thirds of the mind or you know maybe a third to two-thirds of the mind would still be compatible with the body Mm -hmm. The idea is, if you take your mind out of your body, you would have to, in order to have it inhabit properly and not be sickly, physically sickly, you'd have to put that mind back in a genetically similar body. Mm -hmm. This is what they were looking for, was the mind that would be added from the reinsert programmer, mm -hmm. whatever you want to call them, would have to be compatible with the body. Mm -hmm. So they'd have to pick kids of the same body type of the people they were programming. We believe they had mm -hmm. Italians, we believe they had Irish, and they had blonde, blue-eyed types. Mm -hmm. You know, Irish, Anglo-Saxon, and then blonde, blue-eyed types mm -hmm. for what they were doing. Now, these kids, once they were processed, the ones that lived and survived, we have information from deprogramming two boys that essentially they would be sent into special government projects, into genetic research, they would be put back in with their families, or they would be sent off as workers. You know, the, they could configure the mind to be the perfect worker, mm -hmm. for instance. This is what we know of the Montauk Boy Project. Mm -hmm. We know the big long bunker just north of the Radar Hill was where they did the work because we've deprogrammed three Montauk Boys and they all remember that bunker. Mm -hmm. In fact, they almost go into fright when they see pictures of it but they don't go into that degree of fright when they see the overall uh, mm -hmm. base itself. You know, as their main memories is in that bunker. Mm -hmm. They describe that room that has a three-sided room and then two sides this way. Mm -hmm. They describe a balcony. All this, this is all three in common, describe a balcony. You can see today there were big hooks that a balcony was hung on. Mm -hmm. So we have located the area. Now we've had a number of sensitives, including how they're in there, do a read on it, and they can feel the horror and the fright and all this that was done in there. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and Duncan broke down in one of the bunkers and was essentially trying, I guess, to repent or saying he's sorry, whatever it is. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we have reason to believe that we've located the area they did this in. Mm -hmm. That, in a nutshell, is what the Boys Project was about. Mm -hmm. Yeah, interesting. How long did that last? Between what periods do you...? Well, we figure it started probably in the 60s out at Montauk. Mm -hmm. And probably it wasn't as advanced until they got the mind control project going. Yeah, where they could so do that was an aspect research. of a, maybe a larger project? Yeah. yeah. And, and we, we believe, believe it's still going on. And it's still going on, yeah. Somewhere else? Yeah, in Montauk. Oh, yeah? In the underground. The same type of ma control, manipulation, well, we, we mental manipulation? Well, we've heard rumors of kidnapping still being done as late as 88. If they're working in 88, they're probably still working. Yeah. That's like only five years ago. Hmm. Hmm. So there is evidence of activity there right now. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah there's also a connection to the uh, programming of the uh, boys with the uh, maybe some of the twin research of, on twins that was done in the uh, Nazi regime. Mm -hmm. I don't 
personally have a lot of information on that, but that's uh, there is a, there is a lot of research on twins, psychosexual research on twins, mm -hmm. uh, psychic research that I believe was conducted by uh, Dr. Mengele, uh, mm -hmm. the Nazi. Mengele, you mean? What? Mengele? Mengele. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I don't know if you have any more information, but there is a connection between that and the uh, the the blue-eyed, the blonde hairs of the Nazis, oh, and also right. the uh, Pleiadians. There's a legend to the, with the Pleiadians and the blue eyes and the blonde hair, and there's, yeah, there's, right. a, there's a connection there as well. Yeah. But I'm, I'm not prepared to elaborate on that myself. Yeah, yeah as with some of the um, uh, Montauk, was just hoarded with German scientists. Uh, this is something that my father was involved in before World War II, during and then after, is bringing some of these German scientists over. Mm -hmm. Um, and um, hiding them in this in this estate, and then processing through, and then going into these other government projects. Mm -hmm. which Montauk, I don't know what do we figure. Thirty percent, forty percent were, were German-oriented scientists. Oh, really? Very, very heavy in that that investigation. Of course, then there's the the rumor uh, that it's a bit more of a rumor that the the Germans had, had did have a, a their working time machine mm -hmm. um, back um, just prior to the war, and it invo involved sound, sonics, mm -hmm. and light. They were they were stressing the uh, the electromagnetic field enough where it went from a potential form for doing work into a realize. And of course, everything mm -hmm. is a potential, as the will can end tomorrow. Well, will, will it or will it not? Mm -hmm. The degree of it will or will not, and the potentiality if if there is enough information and can be directed and forced, mm -hmm. then the potential becomes higher and then it can do real work. Mm. So they had, um, it was, you or Al have the information on that. Um, well, that's appeared in a number of these supermarket rags, this mm -hmm. idea of the Nazi time machine. Yeah, yeah but you, you guys had it independently of that. Well, we've had people tell us of it, but we don't know how credible the, the, the people are. There's no real solid source of it, but there's enough reports coming in from what we consider to be independent uh, people to say that there probably is some base to this rumor. Mm -hmm. How complete and how functional their time device was, we really don't know. Yeah. There's also uh, a, a question you asked earlier about the financing, mm -hmm. and uh, do you want to answer that, Preston? Yeah. Do you remember there was a train robbery in Europe right after World War II where they were bringing Nazi gold and treasures out on this train? There's been a few movies made about yeah, it. Yeah, right. Yeah. <clears throat> where they blocked off this tunnel and then the train was robbed. Mm -hmm. That's been traced. And this this has been backed up, going through the Paris and then it went on a boat and it went out to Long Island. The mm -hmm. boat sunk off of Montauk Point, and what we believe happened is the people from Fort Hero or Montauk Navy Base went out with divers, recovered the gold and such, and the treasure was stashed in the underground at Montauk. Hmm. This is what they used to run the project for years and years. Then when that money finally ran out, we're talking back in the 40s and 50s, billions of dollars. Mm -hmm. So in 60s, 70s, and 80s, God knows what it was worth. But when they ran out of money, then it was... Uh, financed by the uh, military-industrial corporate structure, mm -hmm. namely the Krupps, IT&T, financed it. Mm -hmm. So remember, they couldn't have this appear as an appropriation in Washington, mm -hmm. because then Congress would ask, what are we spending all this money on? Yeah. So it was funded by all sorts of clandestine funds. Mm -hmm. And mostly it was a Nazi goal, from what we understand, and then mm -hmm. it went over to uh, ITT funding. Mm -hmm. What other um, corporations and uh, so forth have been, are, have been involved in the project? Rand? RCA was involved. Rand? Sperry Rand was involved. Yeah. Hazeltine, we believe, was involved. AIL Grumman? was involved. No, Grumman didn't seem to be involved in it. Mm -hmm. I was handed a list of corporations by uh, one of the Senator the Goldwater's aides, and mm -hmm. today all those corporations are out of business or reorganized. Mm -hmm. With a new name. With a new name, oh, yeah. new management. What's interesting to note here also is in the mid-80s to late-80s, there was something coming around called a core audit, C-O-R-E, in the industrial plants. Mm -hmm. 
The excuse for this was looking for the $250 toilet seat. Mm -hmm. In this audit, they would send bean counters into the, each plant. They would go to every person in the plant, including the janitor, the floor workers, the people working on production. Mm -hmm. What are you working on? What does this tell us? If you're looking for the $250 toilet seat, that's management. Mm -hmm. The guy building this chassis on the floor, he knows nothing of what this charge for. Mm -hmm. Fact that they went to everybody and was asked what you're looking, what you're working on, we were told at AIL, do not list they, they told us what project to say we were working on. Mm -hmm. You know, what they were telling us is, well, we take money from this project to get this project going. Mm -hmm. You're supposedly working on this project. When the orders come in, don't tell them you're working here, but you're working on this project. Mm -hmm. The only thing that makes sense to me is they're looking for hidden projects. Of course, mm -hmm. Montauk was a massive hidden project. Mm -hmm. And the government, the political government learned its lesson you got to find these hidden projects ah, okay. to find these black hole things they don't know of. They were stung once. The way we understand it, Senator Goldwater, before he retired, called for a joint session of the two houses, and he told the uh, lawmakers that essentially the Montour project was a project meant to control their mine on Capitol Hill. Mm -hmm. Because imagine how much blue smoke <laughs> there was on Capitol Hill. Yeah. At that point, this sent the whole congressional off on a rag towards the military industrial establishment. Mm -hmm. This is why the military industrial establishment is almost dead today. Mm -hmm. They don't dare squeak anymore. Mm -hmm. They've lost all the freedoms they had. Up until the whistle was blown, the military industrial establishment had almost carte blanche. Mm -hmm. Nobody questioned them. Now they're questioned so heavily, the companies are worried, they're upset. The companies are being hit with fine for this, that, and the other thing is they find this stuff and mm -hmm. slowly but surely they're all going out of business. Mm -hmm. Everyone has is ESP. It's, it's naturally occurring. It's um, typically in the levels of the third and fourth subconscious behavior following the typical psychology uh, aspect of things, levels below conscious behavior. Um, I think there's 12 typically is what they speak of. That's what, levels. They, that's what they generally talk of. Uh, there are actually more mm -hmm. uh, when you speak of the esoteric, but it's levels third and fourth subconscious. That's if it has not been monkeyed with. Mm -hmm. um, everyone uses their ESP daily. Mm -hmm. It's incorporated. It's the, the uh, the reason the ESP is kept away from the conscious uh, to the degree it is because the, a person's connection to these alternate parallel zones, mm -hmm. um, there, there's vast amounts of information. Mm -hmm. um, and the, the, the conscious behavior would become overwhelmed with it. Mm -hmm. So there's a necessary screening, filtering up to the subconscious, up to the conscious level. Which is the evolutionary process, is it? Right, right. So um, certainly there are, the, the avenues can certainly become clouded with daily stresses and learn phenomenons and habits and such. And, um, most people do get an idea these days that some people who have these esoteric uh, considerations, psychics, they do have something to them. Mm -hmm. But uh, it's still kind of in the infancy that everyone has this naturally occurring mm -hmm. process that is, that is for at their disposal mm -hmm. and can be used to we also speak of that long term memory is used every day to read to reach this um, information mm -hmm. zone called a kashik it's a mm -hmm. it's an esoteric holding zone of information mm -hmm. um, and then everyone uses it daily for the long term mm -hmm. extension of the energy outside the body to the zone and acquire it mm -hmm. um, but that's certainly it's not standard stuff. Um, mm -hmm. And is is basic. Mm -hmm. It's basic in, in metaphysics. It's nothing new, but needs to be presented in a way which is not threatening to the person and mm -hmm. is natural. Mm -hmm. It's part of um, um, part of living and growing and in, in, in children. It's uh, they they have these very strange and unencumbered mm -hmm. sense of, of barriers, and they go out and their energy leaves the body, and they come mm -hmm. out with these fantastic stories. Yet they're mm -hmm. poo hooed. Mm -hmm. So, um, 
we all come back from children in that yeah. sense that unstructured un um, how do we say unbarriered sense of, of love and hate the um, um, other than all the space time and the um, boys project certainly is the that very queer sense what one of the buildings I walked into that what I came up with is that E.T., that, e. that very, uh, very yes, that yellow house, yeah. very strange discourse of energy that was very prevalent. And there was, on, on Preston's video, there's this handrail that's so very low. Yeah, it's low. Very, oh, very low, low to the there's other number of tiles. the hand railings in these buildings were low, mm -hmm. as if either small people or children going up and down those stairs. Mm -hmm. well, I think what you're asking about is the alien involvement. Yeah, of which I don't have much recall in my sense. I've, that's very different. Mm -hmm. um, I was very were you aware of it when you were involved? Um, I'm sure I was. Uh, like there's a particular pattern, um, or, or like, vulgarity is not the word, but it's a raw energy sense mm -hmm. that some of the ET groups have. Certainly not yeah. all. The more evolved or uh, the more, more forgiving type. Um, but there are, um, the Preston's got three or four stories, and I, I don't mean to say it's a story per se, but cataloging of some of his memories regarding mm -hmm. some of some of the, the, the forms you were involved in. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, if in the mid-70s <clears throat> you went down to about the second and third level underground at Montauk, this stretched out for miles as you got down. You know, each level built bigger and bigger. Mm -hmm. In the bottom levels, maybe were five miles square on a side. Mm -hmm. In the second and third levels, all of a sudden, there appeared in the mid-70s a UFO underground, mm -hmm. a disc-shaped flying saucer. If somehow we believe this is one of the saucers that were trapped in the Eldridge experiment. Uh. And, you know, as Duncan says, it potentialized itself. It took a number of years to appear. All of a sudden, in the mid-70s, 75, 76, there it was, solid. <laughs> and it was sitting in a huge magnetite deposit, because there's a lot of magnetite out at Montauk. Mm -hmm. This, for some reason, disturbs the anti-gravity drive of the UFO, so it couldn't get out. It was stuck there. So, of course, this would be the first alien involvement. Yeah, a spacecraft out there. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Alien constructed spacecraft. Now, of course, there are some live aliens taken out of that thing. Al Bielik can tell you quite a nice story that he was involved in communicating with the aliens out that were underground. Mm -hmm. Now, later on, the whole Montauk project, when we started to go deeper into the mind aspect and the time aspect, mm -hmm. there was a lot of implementation of alien technology at Montauk. I personally believe that Montauk was most likely a test bed for some of the technology interchange between the aliens and the U.S. government. Mm -hmm. That they were trying out a lot of these great ideas they got. They're also trying to replicate systems and technologies they had on the captured crash mm -hmm. UFOs. Also, I can remember I had an office in the radar tower. It was the first office on the second floor in the back. Mm -hmm. Next to my office was another office and I remember, I swear on a stack of Bibles, I remember a lizard man mm -hmm. in that office. It was His Highness Draco something, I can't remember the other name. Mm -hmm. and. He was about six foot, seven foot tall, had sort of like scaly skin, humanoid. He walked erect like we do, he had mm -hmm. two arms, two legs. He had a tail, but it really didn't show most of the time. Mm -hmm. He had somewhat of a humanoid face, strange eyes, a big mouth, and you know, looked like what you would expect if you're going to put together a lizard man. Mm -hmm. There was a being on Star Trek called, called the Gorn that Captain mm -hmm. uh, Kirk fought mm -hmm. on this planet. This man that I w worked next to sort of resembled that being. Mm -hmm. Now... How did that strike you? Did, I mean, I didn't that would have, have to be a to traumatic experience. No? Not to you? 
I didn't have that much to do with it. Mm -hmm. I call it it. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure whether it was he or she. Mm -hmm. But I didn't have that much to do with it. But you accepted it. his presence as something well, normal for What else do you do? Mm -hmm. <laughs> You're working next to this thing. <laughs> True. You know, it's, how are you, how are you, know, that sort <laughs> of thing. Want to go for coffee and donuts? Yeah. Yeah. He spoke in a hissy voice, you know, hissed a lot, uh -huh. and sort of sounded like he was loud whispering most of the time. Uh -huh. and then we had those little ugly things. The gray type? Yeah, and then we had the five-footers and the three-footers. We used to, get away, you bother me. Oh, yeah. You know, that was the way you handle those, and those things smelled. In fact, there's a, uh, there's an odd recollection I have for both the uh, reptilian man and the greys, the little greys. The little greys, I think the idea that's floating around the UFO community that they absorb their food through the skin and excrete through the skin is correct. Mm -hmm. Because my memories of those greys stunk to high heaven. They smelled like bowel and fecal matter mm -hmm. and urine. And we used to regularly, if, they, if we had to work with them, we picked the thing up physically and throw it in the shower and wash it. <laughs> because we couldn't take the odor of it. And one day, I don't know who it was, got the right idea. Well, after we clean it, let's spray him with, with Lysol. Maybe it'll smell better for a while. <laughs> they got him drunk. <laughs> he loved the Lysol. The Greys are going to the commissary, getting cans of Lysol and spraying themselves with it. They loved it. And then... Even though it's true stories, a good laugh, right? I don't know. It's great. Great entertainment. <laughs> and then the other thing that we ran across, I needed some sodium hydroxide for a special soldering project. Of course, we all know Drano is essentially sodium hydroxide. So I went to the commissary, got a can of Drano. So I took a glass, put some water in it, dissolved the Drano in it. I was using this as flux of solid wood. His Highness Draco comes in. <laughs> Oh, no. And he said, more! <laughs> so I got another glass of water, poured some more Draco on it, handed it to him. <laughs> and the, and the, the Draco was getting drunk on Draco. How the hell they could stomach that stuff? I don't know. So finally, he really tied a rag on. That, tuning out of 11. Yeah, that thing, he really tied out a rag. He must have drank about eight glasses of water made of the heavy, thick drain. Oh, yeah, I put enough in so it was thick because I was using a solder paste. And he gulp. <laughs> and finally, he came, came back to normal sense. He asked me, how do you make that stuff? That's the greatest stuff he'd ever had. So I told him, go get some Drano. And they had, they had to keep buying more and more Drano. Because the reptilians are getting drunk on the Drano, and they had to buy more Lysol because the uh, Greys are getting drunk on the Lysol. But that's the, the reason why the project would get fallen yeah. down drunk on the Drano. I think yeah, that's so. funny. Um, were they involved in the project then, directly? I think they were there more as advisors. Mm -hmm. This is why I think they were there as advisors. Were they there of their free will? <laughs> It seemed to be. Yeah. Because they were treated well by the station management. Mm -hmm. you know, it was almost like, Your Highness, how are you? They were kowtowing to the reptilian. Mm -hmm. well, was, there was also Syrians there, for sure. That, that I get a feel for. I, I, I don't recall any meeting, per se, but direct the Syrians are there, too. I well, we believe the chair came from the Syrians. That's right. Mm -hmm. That's yeah. right. That's right. So they could have, Syrians could have come to help us interface the chair. The chair originally came from ITT, Mac A Radio, you know, ITT World Communications, Mac A Radio. They were experimenting with this with this thing in some sort of a strange lab they had in Southampton that was under the main Worldwide Communications building. Mm -hmm. In fact, most of the workers in the uh, for ITT Communications didn't even know of the existence of this underground lab. Mm -hmm. But they were tied in with a lot of the antennas and such on the site. And they had... You know, they had the technology exchange project from the Assyrians, oh, yeah. ITT. So there were the ITT chairs, but also later on they brought in more direct Syrian chairs. In fact, Al Bielik could tell you about, he was involved in making a computer interface, interface a Syrian computer to the Cray-1, or the Cray-2. Now when you refer be, to the Syrians, can you be more specific? They're the beings, they look somewhat human-like. Mm -hmm. They're from Cirrus 8 in mm -hmm. the Sirius star system. They're the ones that uh, 
they will worship this god in the Egyptian culture. You know, the Egypt okay. had the Sir, uh, god Cirrus. Mm -hmm. They were the Syrians. Mm -hmm. And they're hum they're like us. They look somewhat like us. They're taller head and uh, bigger eyes, I believe. Same skin, same. Same old skin, yeah. Mm -hmm. In the, in the town. Oh, the, are, are you serious about those stories? Yeah. Are what you, is the object, the objectivity of the uh, the you know Drano story? I mean, like Preston, if you could just put that in perspective for the audience, the objectivity because yeah. it's, it's a bizarre story. It is a bizarre story, but I remember it happened. I, that, that, this whole thing is in the bottom. Totally bizarre. So <laughs> it fits well, right saying, in. You know? Their body chemistry <laughs> does is arranged that they must run on an alkaline system mm -hmm. instead of the carbon cycle. They're mm -hmm. not quite the carbon cycle that we are. Mm -hmm. Although they supposedly have some common energetics, um, sorry, genetics between us, some common genetics. Mm -hmm. Apparently, their body type, body base is quite a bit different from ours. Because if, if we drink drain, it will kill us. Mm -hmm. Or if we spray Lysol on our skin, it just stings, but it doesn't get us drunk like the Greys do. Mm -hmm. So apparently, their body chemistry must be different enough that they assimilate these chemicals different from what we do. Yeah, obviously. Yeah. But, uh, you know, sure, it's a funny story, but uh, it does say something about the biology of the aliens. Mm -hmm. That they have a major difference in their biology. Perhaps a Saurian evoluted form. I don't know. Yeah. You're getting out of my field. My field is physics and science and electronics, mm -hmm. yeah. not biology. Yeah. You know, I, biology was my worst science. Mm -hmm. well, that's what this is all about in the end, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> it's about our biological Biology. evolution, nothing Absolutely. else, nothing sure. else, Absolutely. <laughs> you know, yeah. it's not about UFOs.